Mayor John McLucky and Hugh O'Donnell were arrested. A few men were tried, but none were convicted. Even so, the power of the Amalgamated Association was eroding. By early August, 1,500 non-union workers were turning out steel at Homestead. The militia, declaring the occupation over, left in October. A month later, the number of workers had climbed to 2,700 non-union men. With winter approaching, their ranks decimated, the money all but gone, the strikers and their families could hold out no longer. It's important to understand without jobs, they can't feed their children. And it's the plight of the children that so often will break a strike and force the strikers to give in because they don't want their children to die. On November 20th, nearly five months after the strike began, a vote was taken. The strikers finally capitulated. They would return to work. But for most, it was already too late. I think the story of Homestead ended long before the Union actually capitulated. The world ends not with a bang, uh, but with a whimper. And that's how the Union dies in Homestead. It just ends. Frick telegrams Andrew Carnegie, and he, it's two words, victory slash early. And Frick said that he doesn't want any men who struck against this mill ever employed by the Carnegie Steel Company, Homestead or otherwise, period. So for Frick, it was a complete wipeout. It was a complete purge. And these men were really cast aside. Many of the skilled workers who had been identified with the union lost their jobs. They were not allowed back at work. Those skilled workers who had been part of the union but not in the leadership were invited back, but not to their old jobs. The new Carnegie Steel at Homestead 50% of the workers had never been there before. Frick watched as the former union workers, what was left of them, returned to the mill. He cabled Carnegie, Our victory is now complete and most gratifying. Do not think we will ever have any serious labor trouble again. We had to teach our employees a lesson, and we have taught them one they will never forget. For Frick and Carnegie, it was a victory. There would be no meaningful union presence in the steel industry for the next 40 years. For many of the workers who dared stand up against Carnegie Steel during the Homestead strike, their lives were destroyed. Most of the leaders were blackballed at Carnegie's mills and throughout the steel industry. Among them, Mayor John McLucky, who resigned in November 1892, and Hugh O'Donnell. Neither would ever work in steel again. Hugh O'Donnell ended up being a broken man. By October, November, he was ready to fold his tent and give in to the corporation and do anything he could to redeem himself and, and get his job back. McLucky ended up a kind of vagabond. He went all over the world, in part because he can't quite believe that the world that he imagined, the world that he was such a critical part of, was destroyed forever by the Homestead strike. Within a year, wages were reduced by half for many of Homestead's skilled workers. Their union never regained the power it once had. The defeat also took its toll on the town. A writer for McClure's magazine traveled to Homestead in 1893 to report back on the wasteland that he found. He described Homestead as squalid and unlovely as well could be imagined. Such towns are sown thickly over the hill lands of Pennsylvania. They are American only in the sense in which they represent the American idea of business. Once the union was out of the way and management made all the decisions on staffing, on wage rates, on work rules, on the length of the workday, the potential for increasing productivity and increasing profits was unlimited. 
In 1901, Andrew Carnegie sold his entire company to J.P. Morgan. In today's dollars, Carnegie's personal share of the profits would be valued at well over five billion dollars. When the deal was done, Morgan congratulated him on becoming the richest man in the world. In the years to come, Carnegie would say over and over and over again that he had no part to play in the events at Homestead and that Frick made all the decisions and that if he had been at Homestead it would have been different. That's just totally unreal and untrue. He knew what, precisely what was going on. Frick was carrying out a strategy that the two of them had put together. Carnegie had broken unions well before Frick was on the scene. So Carnegie was not the innocent that he would later make himself out to be. Carnegie would spend his later years trying to give away the fortune he had so carefully built up. He endowed over 2,500 public libraries throughout the world, music halls, institutions of higher learning. But his remarkable philanthropy could not erase the sting of Homestead. What upset Carnegie the most in the aftermath of Homestead was that all of his philanthropic efforts were questioned. Carnegie does not give away his money because he's guilty about what happens at Homestead. He's not guilty. He's not ashamed. He believes it's something that had to happen, that the union was in the way of progress, that he knew which way the world was going. Homestead was the darkest day in American labor history. But for all the terrible things that happened, for all the uh, vile actions of Carnegie and Frick, look at the positive aspect of their legacy. They did create the largest steelmaking enterprise in the entire world. That not only provided employment for untold thousands of people, and it also created this country as we know it today. The lessons learned at Homestead would continue to affect the American workplace for decades to come. The battle at Homestead signaled a profound shift in the United States. It marked the ascendance of corporate values, of a corporate way of thinking, of a corporate life for most Americans. The dream that America would be different vanished, I think, with Homestead. Working men were told that theirs was to be a subordinate place. And now, a century later, when we see the enormous gap between the bosses and the workers, I think we see one of the legacies of Homestead.